Hello students, welcome to another episode of Microeconomics. Today we are starting chapter one, which is about the five foundations of economics. So you probably have some idea already, at least vaguely, of what economics is. Here I'll make that definition more precise. We'll also look at some common ideas that you'll see repeated throughout the entire semester, these five foundations. Now, not every book says five foundations. That terminology is a little bit idiosyncratic to this particular textbook. However, you will see these ideas in just about any econ text you ever read. So it's just a different way of organizing the same concepts. So first, what is economics? The short definition I often give if I'm asked um, unexpectedly, as I say, economics is the study of scarcity. More precisely, the study of how people allocate their limited resources to satisfy their nearly unlimited wants. So if you asked everyone, what would you like? They'd probably tell you quite a few things. I want a really big house. I want lots of nice fancy cars, etc., etc. If you try to satisfy all those desires, you would quickly run out of goods in this scarce and finite world. So there's just not enough stuff to go around to please everybody. We have this scarcity problem that we're trying to solve. So economics, the study of how we deal with that scarcity problem. So here are the five foundations. Number one is incentives. That's a pretty big one. It's the first foundation for a reason. If you talk to an economist for any length of time, you'll probably hear the word incentives repeated quite a bit. We'll divide them up into positive versus negative incentives and also look at direct versus indirect. We'll talk about trade-offs. So because there's not enough stuff out there to satisfy everyone, um, we're going to be not 100% happy all the time. There are some trade-offs to make in those decisions. Now, those first two concepts of incentives and trade-offs might be familiar to you already, at least vaguely. But the third one, opportunity cost, might be novel. So we'll spend some more time on that when we get to that section of the chapter. Number four is marginal thinking. That is looking at the costs and benefits of adding one additional unit and above, above what you are, already have. And we'll have to look at trade creates value. Now, um, this could be a bit of nitpicking here, but I don't really think trade creates value should be a separate foundation. That's because these other foundations before it, when combined, imply trade creates value. So it's not really an independent foundation, but rather something you can derive from the other foundations. But I'll follow your textbook's approach and present it as being a separate foundation. Now our next chapter, chapter two, is going to go into more depth on trade creates value. So I'll just touch the basics in this chapter and we'll go more in depth later on. All right, let's go and talk about incentives. So definition, in case you don't know what it is, incentives are factors that motivate a person to act or exert effort. So like I said, economists talk about incentives all the time. They're the first foundation for a reason. So by positive or negative incentives, you mean rewards or punishments. So positive incentives are rewards, negative incentives are punishments. For other categories, we have direct versus indirect. By direct, we mean the incentive is communicated to you explicitly. Indirect incentives are implicit. Now, important to watch out for, and we'll see some examples shortly, is that these indirect incentives can be just as powerful in shaping human behavior as the direct, as the explicit ones. However, because they are implicit, it's easier to overlook them. Oftentimes, if some policy has some bad unintended consequence, it's because the policymakers overlooked these 
indirect incentives. So we'll see a number of examples of that. So here's an example you guys are all very familiar with, the classroom setting. So in classes, we do have a system of incentives set to try to achieve the desired results. So um, I guess I said, show up to class here, but um, it's an online class. I want you guys to watch the videos, put it that way. I want you to study hard. I want you to, much as says, watch the videos and do well on your homework and your exams. Now, unfortunately, most people don't really like studying hard. You can probably think of things that are more fun to do than spend five hours of the Econ textbook in front of you. So how to get you to do that instead of just say, watch cat videos on the internet. I got to set up some incentives to make you want to do that. So the positive incentive is that if you do all the things that we want you to do, study hard, watch the videos, and do well in the exams, our rewards are the positive incentive, and that positive incentive is a grade of an A. If you don't watch the videos and you don't read the book and you don't study at all and you do badly in the assignments, I want to discourage that behavior I create a negative incentive, a uh, grade of an F for the folks who do that. So by designing incentives in that way, I motivate you guys to study, keep up with the material, and perform well. Society is full of other positive and negative incentives. Um, another example out of many, we want to discourage people from committing crimes. We don't want people to um, drive drunk or assault other people, that's all bad stuff. We discourage that by threatening them with prison. That's a negative incentive. So because we're so accustomed to a world with incentives, they're so deeply embedded to everyday life, it can be kind of hard to imagine what life would be without them. And because they're so accustomed to them, you're not really aware of their effects. Now it turns out we don't have to imagine a world without incentives. There actually are examples out there. So I found this example in a chess book. Um, so my spare time, I'm not teaching you guys economics. I spent a lot of time at the chessboard. Back in the um, 1900s, a lot of the world champions came from the Soviet Union. They wanted to dominate chess by um, being a professional for their players while the Western chess players were pretty much amateurs. And in the chess books written by these players from communist countries, they often write a little bit about what life was like back then. And what you basically see is a world without incentives. So I'll read you a quote from this book by um, a grandmaster from Romania. I think it was Romania. And it was communist at the time. And he's describing his first day at work. So he writes, I'll never forget my first, quote, working day, unquote, there. When I showed up with my nomination paper in hand, there were less than the appointed dozen people in the office. So in communist countries, there is very little incentive to work hard and little or no punishment to, if you don't work hard, you get roughly the same income either way. So you might have a job where you're being told, show up to work, but if you don't show up at work, you don't lose your job and you don't have any pay reduction. So not everyone shows up to work. He goes on to write, some of them were reading the tabloid, The Sport, so they weren't working. One was eating, also not working, and others, in painful minority, were pretending to write in some huge books. So some workers were even there, and the workers who were there mostly were not working they had very little incentive to do a good job. When I introduced myself, I was immediately asked if I played chess. Not exactly saying that's terribly relevant for his job. I was forcing myself to look surprised. So the boss added, what do you expect? It's a state job. They pretend to pay, we pretend to work. So without incentives from salaries and promotions and bonuses and stuff like that, workers are not very motivated to put in the effort. He goes on the right, unfortunately this, quote, 
place of work, unquote, was not the ex an exception, but rather the rule. So when you lack incentives, life looks very, very different. And productivity was way lower in communist countries and income a person and economic output also way lower, much lower quality of life because they just lacked incentives to get people to work hard. So that's a story of what life looks like when you don't have incentives and you force incomes to be roughly equal regardless of how productive or unproductive people are. So that's positive and negative incentives. Let's also look at direct versus indirect incentives. So we said that direct incentives are ones that are communicated explicitly. Indirect incentives are implicit. So you already know about the explicit ones, the direct incentives. That's why I'll spend more time focusing on the implicit, the indirect incentives. So this next example here comes from a book called Freakonomics about um, roughly 15 years ago. It was a bestseller. It's written by Levitt and Dubner. So Levitt was the Akasadin team. I think he works at the University of Chicago, if memory serves. And Dubner was the journalist. So what Levitt does, and what I think is very interesting about his work is that he uses economic tools and economic thinking to study problems that are not traditionally considered economics. So you thought you signed up for an economics class, you probably thought, we're going to learn a lot about money and stuff like that. Well, Levitt does, he takes this economic tool, toolbox, this language of incentives and indirect, direct and indirect incentives, and he applies it to things that might not be, obviously, on the surface at least, about money. Those are things like cheating on exams, probably not what you expected to learn about in an economics class. So here's the setup. So in the debate about education reform, one concern out there is that under the current system, there's not a whole lot of incentives for teachers to do a great job. So the pay structure in the vast majority of school systems is not linked at all to teacher performance. Teachers who do well and teachers who do badly get paid about the same. If there is a difference, if there is a difference in pay, it's based on years of experience not whether you teach well or teach badly. If you can stick around for a certain number of years, it varies, I think, you can get tenured. And once you're tenured, it becomes not literally impossible, but pretty close to impossible to fire. So once they got tenure, the incentives to do well are even weaker. One major motivator for a lot of workers is that if you don't do well, we'll fire you. So that incentive is taken away in the educational environment. So to try to strengthen incentives, what some reformers have proposed is we should link teachers' pay to their students' exam scores. That way, the, the teachers who do well and to make their students learn a lot will be paid more, and that's going to motivate them to work harder. The teachers who do badly and their students fail the exams they're going to get paid less or even get fired. So the direct incentive here is that we're telling teachers, if you get your class to do really well, we'll pay you more money. Now, this plan ended up backfiring, and that's because there's also a powerful indirect incentive at work here as well. And the policymakers who are designing this reform did not anticipate this. So what teachers were not told, but they figured out on their own, was that if they were to cheat, if they were to change their students' answers to make their students do better in the exam, if they were to falsify test scores, that's another way to get a pay raise. And if you think about it, and if you lack ethics, you might think, well, Changing some student exam answers is really easy. Going through the hard work to find how I can become a better teacher and get my students to actually learn more, pretty hard. So if I lack ethics, maybe I'll just take the shortcut and 
falsify my students' answers and change their wrong answers to right answers, get a pay raise that way. So Levitt thought about this very carefully and found some very um, creative tools to look for evidence of cheating, and he found a lot of evidence. So for example, teachers were usually not brazen enough to give everyone 100% on the exams that be a little bit suspicious and that would raise a lot of attention. Usually he found they cheated in much more modest ways that still had a significant impact. For example, he'd say they might change a block of five to 10 answers on an exam. That's enough to raise overall scores by a significant amount and get you a pay raise. It's not dramatic enough to give everyone 100% and draw suspicion. And he has found a lot of evidence of little ways like that that teachers would cheat and give themselves a pay raise without really earning it. So because of this indirect incentive, this um, implicit incentive to cheat, this policy ended up backfiring. Now, this does not by any means um, end the debate. He did suggest, I think, later on in the book that if you do want to link teacher pay to exam scores, you got to do it a different way. You got to make sure teachers have no access to the exams and no way to change the students' answers. You have the exams be administered by some third party who has no stake in the outcome. You have some mechanism like that in place to prevent this cheating. So that's one way you could possibly try to improve upon this idea. So while that incentive to cheat was not explicitly stated, it was quite powerful in influencing the teacher's behavior, and you gotta think about that when you're designing these kinds of policies. Here's another example of a well-intended policy that went wrong because of indirect incentives. So one state wanted to clamp down on drunk driving. Drunk driving causes extra accidents and can cause people who are, um, who are not drunk at all, the victims, can be hit by someone drunk and be injured or killed even by that. So they really wanted to get serious about cracking down on drunk driving. So DUI, driving under influence of alcohol. So to do that, they decided to strengthen the negative direct incentives for drunk driving. So they want to have a stronger punishment, a stronger negative incentive for drunk drivers. And they said that quite explicitly, if you drive while drunk, we're gonna really punish that now even more harshly than before. So that's being communicated explicitly. That's also a direct incentive. Now, there's also an indirect incentive at play here that was overlooked and ended up undermining the overall policy. So let's suppose someone is driving drunk anyways and they get into an accident. They realize that if I get caught driving while drunk, now I'm basing these harsher penalties. So instead of staying there and accepting the punishment, maybe I'll just do a hit and run. If I get into an accident, I'll just try to drive away if my car is still able to drive. And they might catch me eventually, but by the time they catch me, I'll be sober and I'll avoid those harsh DUI laws. So instead of trying to did indeed see a drop in drunk driving, which they liked, but they also saw a surprise increase in hit and runs, which was not part of the plan. This is not to say you can't punish drunk driving or you can't strengthen DUI laws. Rather, if you're gonna do that, you gotta be careful to think about what indirect incentives are also being changed by this. If you wanna clamp down drunk driving, you better also clamp down hit and runs. So hopefully after this section, you've got some, I might call incentive vision to be able to see these implicit incentives to be able to design better policies because now you're aware of these indirect implicit incentives. So that wraps up our first foundation on incentives. Be sure to tune in for our next episode and learn about trade-offs, our next foundation.